Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back again with another historical video. Today, we're starting a new unit, um, and it's it's kind of more or less kind of like unit three where we talk about different chapters. So, and we kind of combine two ideas in world history today where it's pretty important for the setup of how the 20th century, you know, 1900s uh, flows. And so today we're, the unit is titled Nationalism and Imperialism. Um, today we're gonna look back at nationalism and its beginnings in Europe uh, among Germany, Italy, and Mother Russia. All right, I kind of spit. Mm -mm. Not the move. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, this is a two title note day, as as you guys recall, for how notebooks for your notebook checks should be done. Um, we are skipping chapter six and moving on to chapter seven. Um, nationalism triumphs in Europe. Uh, so put that at the top of your margin on your top of your page. That's the title for chapter seven in your textbook. Okay, but today, like I said in the beginning, uh, we are going to focus on Germany and nationalism in Germany and building a German nation, chapter seven, section one. Um, and let's, let's get it. All right, that was your warm up. Okay, so our objectives, we're going to focus on the spread of nationalism in the Germanic states, understand the policies laid forward by Bismarck to unify Germany and follow the beginnings of the German Empire. So, if you didn't know, this is what Germany looks like. Uh, what, is there a time frame? If you look a little bit closer, uh, you can see 1815, 1871 to 1918. Kind of like the, I don't know, the entire almost the entire unit of uh, unit six, uh, unit five, my bad. So um, yeah, all these different colors are all different types of kingdoms, uh, different types of cultures, different types of groups of people. Okay, remember the uh, German nation was formed out of, you know, the Holy Roman Empire the last remnants of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and it's split up into all these different kingdoms. And um, as they were called by the Romans, if you remember your seventh grade history as the barbarous Germanic states, well, we're talking about them. All right, so Napoleon's footprints. So uh, Napoleon made territorial changes in German speaking lands. If, as you recall, he annexed line, la lands along the Rhine River for France. He dissolved the Holy Roman Empire and forced the emperor of the Austrian Empire to be called king, not emperor. And he organized a number of German states in what he called the Rhine Confederation, remember that little buffer state uh, between France and Germany. Um, so Napoleon's defeat didn't make things easier in, um, across Europe. So the Congress of Vienna, remember the people that wanted to keep, you know, the monarchy intact and keep France weak. Our boy, uh, Metternich pointed out that in order to unite Germany, you, it was required to dismantle each Germanic state's government and, you know, People don't like change. <laughs> no one likes change. And uh, 
I don't think they would agree to having one person who's not even from their country say, in order for you guys to unite as one, you can't be king, you can't be prince, you can't be princess, you lose all your titles, you lose all your incomes. You think people are going to say yes to that? Oh, no. However, leaders at the Congress of Vienna also created the German Confederation, which was led by, you guessed it, Austria. You know why? Because von Metternich is Austrian. Unity! Um, so Prussia, is this the next slide? Yeah. Prussia, which, you, as you recall, is right here, this little pink stuff. Prussia does not exist anymore. Back then, Prussia created an economic union called the Zolverein. Um, and this is on your test. Um, and it, what it was, and what it was trying to do is dismantle tariff barriers between the many Germanic states. If you look at all these colors, okay, if you want to sell something from Württemberg all the way to Brandenburg, um, you got to cross all these territories that will charge you different prices for travel. And uh, if you want to trade from, let's say, Stuttgart to Berlin, um, whatever it costs here is going to be either cheaper or more expensive in Berlin. And if you don't recall what a tariff is, a tariff is a tax uh, between imports and exports. Basically, they're importing and exporting in their own country or in their own region for their own people. Right, it's kind of like it's kind of like the thirteen colonies in a way, where they were making their they printed their own money. Each colony had their different. It's it's kind of similar to that. Uh, however, through the Zollverein, Germany still remained politically fragmented. In eighteen forty eight, hey, remember that year? Uh, liberals met and demanded German political unity, and the throne was offered to King William the Fourth of Prussia. And as you recall from our reading of 1848, he refused the throne because he called, uh, he said that the uh, German, these liberals that met at the, what was it, the, oh, let me see if I can find the city. Is it on here? Um, not the Munich conference. It was something conference, The Frank was it the Frankfurt? Something, com Frankfurt Convention or whatever, something. And uh, he said, no, sticking his nose, that's me sticking my nose up. He said, no, I don't want the throne because the German princes aren't offering me it. It's coming from the what? The gutter. You're right. He's calling the liberals, the German, you know, politicians from the gutter. Um, so he refused it. Uh, this is if you guys don't know who uh, David Chappelle is, uh, this unity. Um, again, this is Mr. Ovaya going off on a tangent. Uh, when I think unity, uh, I think of Dave Chappelle. If you don't know who Dave Chappelle is, he's kind of like uh, back in the day, Key and Peel, you know, doing different skits. And, uh, you know, if you want to watch it, you can watch it. Uh, if you don't want to watch it, you don't have to watch it. I'm not going to show it because why would I show a video on YouTube when I'm posting this video to YouTube? Anyways, um, enter stage left, Otto von Bismarck, our, our guy. So Bismarck came from Prussia's Junker class. Uh, say that out loud with me. Junker, okay, not Junker, Junker. It's actually even spelled out how you pronounce it in your book, which was made up of conservative land-owning nobles. Uh, he first served Prussia as a diplomat in Russia and in France. In 1862, King Willie I made him prime minister. And if you know anything about governments, um, prime minister is kind of like 
right hand man, the second in charge. Uh, within a decade, he will rise to the position of chancellor, which is another step up, which is again, you're just the right hand man to the king. Uh, and he used a policy called blood and iron, iron and blood, blood and iron, um, to unite the German states under Prussian rule. This is a test question. Uh, and so we're going to look at his policies of blood and iron. Um, sounds pretty gruesome, right? Right. That's our boy Otto von Bismarck. Um, with the uh, looking like walrus with that mustache. There's another picture of him. Why do I have two pictures? That's weird. Maybe I meant to delete this picture and show he's more of a, you know. Oh, this is kind of when he was prime minister and I think this is when he was chancellor. Get used to those pointy hats. All right, if you know um, some Metallica, master, master. Uh, you can just write master, it doesn't matter. Uh, he, he being Bismarck, had the will of an ox. He was very strong. Um, very, he had this demeanor of being, you know, don't mess with me type of, type of vibes. Uh, he was a master of real politique test question. Real politique, not real politic. Real politique which is realistic policies, politics, based on the needs of the state. In this case, Bismarck's realpolitik, power was more important than principle. So you're gonna, you're gonna cut some corners in order to maintain your power than being you know, in the right or in the wrong. So although Bismarck was responsible for uniting Germany, he was not a real German nationalist. And it's kind of funny now that I bring this up because this guy, you know, he's Prussian, okay? And he helps unite Germany. Can you think of any other German history figure who is not German, who became the leader of Germany? We'll save that one for later. Okay. He was loyal to the Hohenzollerns. Hohenzollerns, uh, which was the ruling dynasty in Prussia. Obviously, they had a monarchy. And he thought by unifying Germany under the Prussian, for the Prussian dynasty, it would bring more power to the Hohenzollerns. But, you know, so this is the house of Hohenzollern. Um, this is the family tree. And if you think about it, our boy, where is it? Frederick Willie the fourth, Mr. I'm too good for the gutter. Um, his brother, William, becomes the German emperor, 1871, right? And just so you know, when we start talking about World War I, um, notice this is Charlotte. She marries Nicholas I of Russia. Okay. So therefore, the German and Russian kingdoms are, are relatives, blood relatives. So... Keep that, keep that in mind. All right, so making moves. So his first move while as PM, prime minister, was to strengthen the army. Uh, the liberal legislature refused to vote for funds for the military because, hey, if you want to build, build the military, uh, that costs money. And Bismarck used that money uh, that, had he, that had been collected uh, for other uses. So, uh, you know, remember, power is more important than principle so, you know, the, the German government has collected all this money uh, for, you know, what do you just say, taxes or uh, education. And he's going to use that money to fund his military campaigns. All right. Power, more important than principles, taking money that might be used for education, that might be used for health services, that might be used for um, 
I don't know. Did I, I said health. You know, tax relief uh, for beginning businesses, and he's going to use it to fund the military. So, with a powerful army ready to be disposed of, Bismarck prepped for an aggressive foreign policy plan. And over the next decade, Bismarck will take Prussia into three wars and three wars that boosted Prussian prestige and power and paved the way for German unity. Unity! Telemaphy! It only makes sense if you watch the video. Um, annexation. So we've kind of talked about annexation a little bit. Annexation means to like add or include. So uh, his first move was to make an alliance in 1864 with, you know, von Metternich's uh, Austrian Empire. Um, so on your, this is, this slide is a test question. Just saying, the slide, test question. Uh, again, I'm pointing at the screen here. Um, so, you know, on the last slide I said, three wars. So that is a test question. What were the three wars that Bismarck took Prussia to and describe them, name them, and explain them? Um, so Prussia and Austria then seized the provinces of Schleswig in Holstein from Denmark. So what do you think the uh, first war is? It's, uh, I think it's called the Second Schleswig War. After the brief war, they divide up the spoils, the spoils of war, winning. Uh, Holstein went to Austria, Schleswig to Schleswig, I don't, if, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, Schleswig to Prussia. If you don't know, Denmark is north of Germany. So in 1866, Bismarck made up an excuse to invade Austria. And this is called the Austro-Prussian War. And it lasted a measly seven weeks. And it ended with Prussia on top. Prussia annexed more provinces uh, in the northern Germanic states. And Bismarck then dissolved the Austrian-led Prussian Confederation, created a new confederation with uh, Prussia in charge. So now that is what, you know, he thought would bring more prestige to the Hohenzollern family. So that's two wars. Look at that. Look at that picture. Look at that mustache. Don't mess with me. All right, so France, France wants a taste. You know, uh, after hearing news of a Prussian victory, Napoleon III, well, well, Louis, Nap well, that's not Nap is that Louis Napoleon? Yeah, I think that's Louis Napoleon. Uh, you know, crowns himself Napoleon III. The leader of France was angered. Remember, Germany is here. France is here on a map. I don't know if that works out correctly. Basically, you know, they're next door neighbors. Um, and he was angry. Uh, a growing rivalry between the two nations led ultimately to the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. And Germans remembered about Napoleon's invasion some 60 odd years before, so they was ready. Uh, and Bismarck is going to uh, provide some propaganda of uh, the French menace to spur on, uh, you know, yeah, you know, that's what they're like, what, what is that? Uh, you know, like when, uh, Cowboys are, are are chasing after someone and they need their horse to go faster. They hit them with their spurs of their cowboy boots to spur German nationalism to create and uh, light the flame of German nationalism. So France is bad, Germany good. And again, it's German nationalism. This this man is Prussian. He's playing German national. Bismarck further escalated the situation by rewriting re and releasing to the press a telegram between William the King and the French ambassador. Uh, and the thoughts of the uh, interpretations of this letter was William dissed the French ambassador. So therefore, 
Napoleon declares war. And the superior Prussian forces will easily destroy the poorly organized French soldiers because, you know, France, come on, come on. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're, they're not good. And France had to accept a humiliating peace treaty in which they lost land in between Germany and France. Uh, this is a map of the Franco-Prussian War. And, you know, the Alsace-Lorraine, this is a heavily, heavily fought over area between these two countries, and it comes up time and time again. All right, so baby Germany is born. Delighted by the good news of victory, Southern Germanic princes and the North Confederation persuaded William to take the title of Kaiser. Again, remember, he's family Hohen's learn. In January 1871, German nationalists celebrated the birth of the Second Reich. Test question. The Second Reich, not Reich, not rich, okay, Second Reich, which is considered an heir to the Holy Roman Empire, the First Reich, okay? You have heir, right? Descendants, relatives, children. So the First Reich is the Holy Roman Empire. The Second Reich, is this German Empire created by uh, William the First and um, Bismarck? So Bismarck will draft a constitution that set up a two-house legislature. Test question: What are the two houses of this legislature that Bismarck set up? You have the Bundesrat, okay, Bundesrat, uh, which is the upper house chosen by rulers of the various Germanic states. And then you have the Reichstag, okay, Reichstag, not Reichstag, Reichstag, okay, Reichstag, which is the lower house elected by universal male suffrage. Now, if you want to call that and compare that to American politics, American, you know, uh, representation of Congress, you can think of the Reichstag as the House of Representatives, and you can think of the Bundesrat as the Senate. However, real power still belonged to the emperor and his chancellor. And boom, we are done. We are done, we are done, we are done. Okay, um, hopefully you did enjoy that uh, little lecture on chapter seven, section one. Um, quick, simple, easy, and um, fast. <laughs> uh, but anywho, Hopefully you guys did enjoy. Uh, your homework is page 251, three through five. Page 251, three through five. Um, and yeah, hopefully you guys did enjoy. As always, stay safe, wash your hands. Peace.